Okay, today we will be speaking of preventive dentistry, which you will find in your chapter 15. Uh, we will pronounce, define, spell the key terms on this lecture, discuss preventative dentistry, the benefits of early dental care. We're going to describe age-related changes and the effects of water fluoridation. So the goal of preventive dentistry is to have a healthy mouth for a lifetime. To achieve this goal, new and recurring disease must be prevented. So the two most common types of dental diseases are your caries and your periodontal disease, which we spoke of in this past week's uh, lecture. Preventative dentistry, it is used to achieve optimal health, as I mentioned, for a lifetime. OK, so we really want to keep our teeth. The partners in prevention to prevent dental disease, a partnership must be formed between the patient and the dental health care team. Optimum oral health can become a reality when partners work together in a program that include the following patient education, use of fluorides, application of dental sealants, proper nutrition, plaque control program. So every time the patient comes in, we need to do what's called patient education. And the guidelines are, listen carefully, each patient will have different needs. The initial instruction, explain the relationship of plaque to dental disease. Assess the patient's motivation and needs. Combine patient's motivating factors with patient's needs. Because a lot of patients want, 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 but is it really what they need? OK, so also if we don't discuss these things, a lot of people have not gone to the dentist in a while or never. And if you don't explain how to brush their teeth or how to take care of their teeth and you might think it's so simple oh, everybody knows how to brush their teeth. If it was that simple, we wouldn't have so many patients and so many dental offices out there. Select the home cleaning aids. This is another thing. There's so many things out there to help. So whether it's selecting a toothbrush brushing method, interproximal cleaning aids such as dental floss and a toothpaste. Keep the instructions simple. Comment positively on the patient's efforts. So how often do we need to educate the patient? Patients should be constantly educated. Every single thing you do on the patient, it you know, to them it's brand new, to us it's not. So you have to remember that and you have to explain it simply so they can understand. Early dental care, pregnancy and dental care, the American Academy of Pediatric Dentistry, AAPD guidelines, advise all pregnant women to receive counseling and oral health care during pregnancy and that infants undergo oral health assessment by their first birthday. Many women are not aware of these guidelines and do not seek dental care during their pregnancy because they believe that they do not have any dental problems. So dental care from zero to five years, even before the baby has teeth, the parents should wipe the gums gently with a clean wet cloth after each feeding. To avoid spreading bacteria that causes caries, the parent should not put anything into the baby's mouth that has been in his or her own mouth, including spoons, cups, and so forth. As soon as the first tooth appears, the parent can begin brushing the baby's teeth in the morning and before bedtime. A pea-sized dab of toothpaste can be used. A pea-sized, the reason, because there's concern about excess consumption of fluoride. Okay, so here's a little baby. And as soon as those little teeth appear, start cleaning them, OK? And this is once you start getting them into the habit of going to the dental office, they won't be scared, OK? Don't put your fears on them. And that's another lecture. We will be talking about that. If you're fearful of the dentist, don't make the, your children fearful or uh, your family members. Dental sealant. They're used as a means of protecting the difficult to clean occlusal surfaces of the teeth from decay. It's a plastic like coating that is applied over the occlusal pits and grooves of the teeth. Sealants cover the occlusal pits and fissures where decay causing bacteria can live. They are an important component in preventative dentistry. 
In several states, the application of dental sealants is delegated to the dental assistant as an expanded function. And here is an example of what a dental sealant looks like. So right where my arrow is, these are the pits and fissures. And you almost can't even see it because it's colored white, okay, like the tooth. Now, things happen as we become older. So it's called age-related related dental changes. The enamel becomes darker in color. Enamel surface develops numerous cracks. The vitality of dentin is greatly decreased. Cementum has compositional changes. Popal blood supply decreases. The size of the pulp chamber is reduced. Abrasion and attrition occur in the crowns of the teeth. Um, one of the, uh, back in the days, uh, the older adults, they used to use a stiff toothbrush, stiff. A lot of them still use it. And because of it, they make these what's called abrasions on their teeth. They kind of wear it away. And also they wear the tops of their teeth away, and that's called attrition. More stuff that's age-related, both coronal and root caries. Alveolar bone becomes more porous. Increase of gingival recession. Systemic disease and medications causing dry mouth. Salivary gland changes causing reduced saliva, uh, saliva flow. Older adults frequently have anemia caused by iron deficiencies, resulting in red and burning tongue. I've actually seen that quite a few times on the older patients. Um, what population is more at risk to develop new coronal root caries? Older, okay, older adults. And because of it, and because of that stiff toothbrush we talked about, right at the gum line, class five, uh, those older adults back in the days, they might have received amalgam fillings or what we uh, used to do. I don't know many dentists that still do it. They're called gold buckle foil fillings, and they're right at the gum line. Uh, they're either in gold or silver, okay? And class five, you will see these. And um, we try not to do those anymore at the gum line, especially in the front. Fluoride, that has been our primary weapon with which to combat dental caries since the 1950s. Slow demineralization enhances remineralization of two surfaces. We talked about that before too. It is a mineral that occurs naturally in food and water. A supply of both systemic and topical fluoride must be available throughout life to achieve the maximum cavity prevention benefits. So we spoke about demineralization. That's the removal of mineral components from mineralized tissues. And remineralization is the process of restoring minerals to a mineralized tissue that has been demineralized. That's a tongue twister right there. Ways of receiving fluoride. Prescription strength fluorides are applied in the dental office. Non-prescription strength fluorides are sold over the counter for at-home use. And fluoridated water is available bottled or through the community. Systemic and topical fluoride. Systemic fluoride is ingested in food, beverages, or supplements. The required amount of fluoride is absorbed through the intestine into the bloodstream and transported to the tissues where it's needed. S excess systemic fluoride is excreted by the body through the skin and kidneys and in the feces. So the systemic, you can find them in bottled water, meat, vegetables, cereals, citrus fruits, teas, and fish. Topical fluoride is applied directly to the teeth through the use of fluoridated toothpaste, mouth rinses, topical applications such as your rinses, gels, foams, and varnishes. And here's an example of them. So these are some, just some, there's so many out there now of topical fluorides. Usually after a cleaning uh, in the dental office, we will offer fluoride and whether we put it on a tray, paint it, or however we give it, we give the patient um, options. Now how fluoride works, pre-eruptive development. Before tooth erupts, a fluid fill sac surrounds it. Systemic fluoride pres present in this fluid strengthens the enamel of the developing tooth and makes it more resistant to acid. 
eruptive development. So after eruption, fluoride continues to enter the enamel and alters the structure of the enamel crystals. These fluoride enriched crystals are less acid soluble than the original structure of the enamel. So before birth, fluoride comes from the mother's diet. OK, and then after it depends on diet and if we're applying uh, fluoride once uh, the child is born. Safe and toxic levels of fluoride. The fluorides uh, used in dental office have been provided safe and effective when used as recommended. Chronic overexposure to fluoride, even at low concentrations, can result in dental fluorosis in children younger than six years with developing teeth. Acute overdosage of fluoride can result in poisoning or even death. And acute overdosage is very rare. So what is fluorosis? It's mottled enamel caused by excessive fluoride intake. So um, I'm going to see. I think I have a picture here. Yeah. And then model enamel is discoloration of enamel, mostly white in color. So A shows a mild fluorosis. So it looks like spots on the teeth, OK? And B shows moderate, OK? So these white spots, unfortunately, once you have them, they're on there forever. The only way you can change those white spots if you get veneers or crowns. Um, so again, we want to avoid that. Fluoride precautions and needs assessment to prevent patients from receiving too much fluoride. We evaluate the patient's current fluoride intake. Uh, the assessments are we the fluoride needs assessment to save time by identifying risk factors, open communication between the dental professional and the patient. It also helps individualize patient fluoride therapies because everybody's different. It allows the dentist to more accurately select the appropriate fluoride therapy. Now, if a patient has well water, usually it's not fluoridated and does not use fluoride toothpaste, then the dentist will prescribe a fluoride supplement or should. OK, so that's an assessment right there. Sources of fluoride. So for more than 50 years, fluoride has been safely added to the community water. Most major cities in the United States have fluoridated water and efforts to fluoridate water in other communities continue. From a public health standpoint, fluoridation of public water supplies is a good way to deliver fluoride to lower socioeconomic populations who may not otherwise have access to topical fluoride products such as fluoridated toothpaste and mouth rinses. So, Fluoridated water, until recently, it was believed that water fluoridation was effective in preventing tooth decay as a result of systemic uptake and incorporation of fluoride into the enamel of developing teeth. It has now been proved that the major effects of water fluoridation are topical, not systemic. So topical uptake means the fluoride diffuses into the surface of the enamel of an erupted tooth rather than being incorporated into unerupted teeth before development. Approximately one part per million of fluoride in drinking water has been specified as the safe and recommended concentration to aid in the control of dental decay. This is approximately equivalent to one drop of fluoride in a bathtub of water. The levels of fluoride in controlled water fluoridation are so low that there's no danger of ingesting an acutely toxic quantity of fluoride. Bottled water may not be equal to tap water with regard to dental health. Some bottled waters may contain fluoride. However, most are below the optimal level of fluoride. The amount of fluoride in bottled water depends on the fluoride content of the source water, the treatment the source water receives before bottling and whether fluoride additives were used. Just so you know, currently the FDA does not require the bottler to list the amount of fluoride content on bottled water. Foods and beverages. So these are your systemic. Again, anything you take in, okay, through the mouth, that's systemic. Many processed foods and beverages are prepared with fluoridated water. 
Again, I mentioned before, meat, vegetables, cereal, citrus, fruit, fruits, they contain a small amount of fluoride and teeth and fish have slightly higher levels of fluoride. Prescribed dietary supplements may be prescribed by the dentist for children ages from six months to 16 years. Note, toothpaste and mouth rinses containing fluoride should not be used as a source of systemic fluoride because with proper use, any excess is spit out and never swallowed. Now, fluoride also can be dispensed in tablet form, and the one that would be dispensing it is the dentist. And as I mentioned, uh, different sources, toothpaste, mouth rinses, gels, varnishes, okay, um, varnishes are usually put on by the dentist and um, the toothpaste, mouth rinses, and gels, you can buy them over the counter unless one is prescribed to you. And these are some examples of some of the fluoride gels and paste and toothpaste. Now, they even sell training toothpaste for young children. I mean, there's so many things out there that can be used, okay? And if you look at this box, it says fluoride free. And then this is the kind that we use in the office. Uh, it's called fluoride varnish. And this has, uh, they come in individual packets with a brush and a little bit of fluoride in this tray. We open it up and use it individually on a patient. And um, we just brush it on their teeth. It's as simple as that. And so you guys know, anytime we do put on fluoride, the post-op instructions are not to eat. Uh, anything, rinse or drink for 30 minutes. Okay, we need the fluoride to work. Now, nutrition and dental caries. Without dietary sugars, dental caries will not occur. Sucrose has a greater decay causing potential than do other sugars, but maltose, lactose, glucose, fructose, and their combinations do have high caries producing capabilities. Flour and starches are not usually decay causing, but when starch is used in conjunction with sugar, like your cookies, the potential for caries increase. Now you may hear the word cariogenic and that means decay causing, okay? Now sugar substitutes, use of less fermentable and non-cariogenic, again, caries causing, artificial sweetness has increased in recent years. You probably have already heard of these artificial sweeteners like your sweet and low, your neutral sweet, your equal, okay? So those are artificial sweeteners. Um, of, of these sugar substitutes, saccharin, aspartame, sorbitol, mannitol are non-cariogenic, which means that they do not cause dental caries, okay? Artificial sweeteners, they were actually initially developed for diabetic patients and those who struggle with obesity. Xylitol, the only one of the artificial sweeteners that actually prevents caries. I actually use xylitol. I love xylitol. Some people don't like the taste. I can't really tell, you know. Um, products that contain xylitol are significantly better. However, they are also more expensive. That is true than products containing other types of artificial sweeteners. I, you know, these are my teeth and I do want to keep them for a lifetime. So when it comes to taking care of my teeth, whatever it takes, I will buy it. Yes, xylitol is expensive, but you know, used properly, it will go a long way. Now they also have sugar-free sodium bicarbonate gum containing xylitol. Okay, so um, again, it is more expensive than your regular gum, but is it well worth it? Yes. Dietary analysis done to determine the patient's current food intake as a means of assessing the need for dietary counseling. Patient maintains a food diary that includes everything he or she consumes each day for one week. The listing includes all meals, supplements, gum snacks, and fluoridated water. It's used to reveal any dietary habits that are likely to have an adverse effect on the patient's oral health. Plaque control program. Plaque can be kept under control with the use of brushing, flossing, interdental cleaning aids, and antimicrobial solutions. A goal of the program is to remove plaque at least once daily. The techniques that are selected must be based on the needs and abilities of the individual patient. 
There are a wide variety of oral hygiene products on the market today. It is important for dental assistants to remain current on the newest products on the market so that they can advise patients, make re recommendations, and answer questions. A lot of the um, choices that you will be giving the patients, we have a lot of dental reps that come to the office and they will give you samples. They will also give you brochures to hand to the patients with coupons. So if you do get any of that, read it before you give it out to the patient. So that way, um, you know, you know what you're talking about, because a lot of patients do look to the professional. You are the professional. They want your professional opinion, your professional advice. Uh, what's good out there? What toothbrush can I use? What toothpaste do you think? This, that, and the other. And you need to know your stuff. So toothbrushes and toothbrushing. There's manual and automatic. If used properly, both types are effective in the removal of dental plaque. There's also baby toothbrushes, which are very small and soft and should be used as soon as the baby's first tooth appears in the mouth. Uh, they sell a finger brush that can also be used. You can use a washcloth. Manual toothbrushes come in many sizes of head size, tough shape and angle and shape of handle. In general, dental professionals recommend soft bristle brushes because these bristles are gentler to the soft tissues and to any exposed cementum and dentin. Nylon bristles are preferred and toothbrushes should be replaced as soon as the bristles show signs of wear or begin to splay outward. So if you see the bristles are no longer straight, uh, change it. The other time you should change a manual toothbrush if you get sick. If you are very sick, you should change that toothbrush and get a new one. Automatic toothbrush have larger handles that contain a rechargeable battery. The larger handle also makes them useful for patients with physical disabilities. Automatic toothbrushes use one of several motions, including back and forth, up and down, or circular. Some models feature pulsating and ultrasonic action. So they come in a variety of styles. This is uh, your manual, okay? The heads could be bigger, smaller. Um, the shape, the angle, and positioning the toothbrush. You should always have the tips, okay, at the gum line, and you go in circular motion. I mean, that is what the automatic does also. It goes around in circles, but even though it does go around, you should start at the gum line and work your way down, making sure that you get the full coronal portion of the tooth. Not only get the uh, uh, buckles, the facials, you get the lingles, the clusals, and don't forget to floss. We will be talking about that. Now, toothbrushing methods, there's a few. The best method, the dental professional will recommend the best method, best suited to the patient's needs. You need to teach the patient to clean the mouth and tongue thoroughly using a systemic approach and to understand the importance of controlling plaque and inflammation. So again, a lot of patients brush their teeth very quickly and they miss a lot of spots because of it. Um, you know, they might only brush the outside and never the inside or the tongue. So again, education is what you guys need to do. When you educate, it's important, whether it's a child or an adult, to give the patient a patient mirror and show them how to brush. They may look at you crazy, but believe it or not, I've had lecture with adults on this and a lot of things that I told them of brushing, what type of toothbrush, how they should brush, they were literally shocked. A lot of people told me too, they shared toothbrushes and I was like, that's a no, no. Everybody should have their own toothbrush. Toothbrushing precautions. The patient should be cautioned about damage that may be caused by vigorously scrubbing the teeth with any toothbrush. Over time, this practice may cause abnormal abrasion, which is wear of the tooth structure, gingival recession, and exposure of the root surface. Improper brushing. So here is abrasion. As I mentioned to you, if you use a very stiff toothbrush, like the older patients, and a lot of them used to saw their teeth. That means like going back and forth, back and forth, never in a circular motion. So what happens is you make these grooves right at the gum line, and it actually... Uh, exposes the uh, 
the root area, okay, the gum recedes, and now this area where the arrows are becomes very, very sensitive, okay? So this is definitely improper, improper brushing technique. Uh, two brushing for unusual conditions, acute oral inflammation or traumatic lesions. So patients should be instructed to brush all areas of the mouth that are not affected and to resume regular oral hygiene practices as soon as possible. Because if you have a lesion or inflammation, if you brush that area really hard, is it going to get better? No. You do have to keep it clean. So you just have to be careful in that area. After periodontal surgery, Patients must, may be instructed to brush only the occlusal surfaces and to use very light strokes over the dressing. After dental extractions, patients are usually instructed to avoid the surgical site, but to brush the other teeth as usual. And after dental restorations, most often patients are instructed to brush all areas of their mouth normally. They just have to be careful again. Um, especially if they're numb. Dental floss or tape removes bacteria plaque and thus reduces interproximal bleeding. Dental floss is circular in shape. Dental tape is flat. Both can be purchased in various colors and flavors. Floss and tape are available in wax and unwax. There's no difference in the effectiveness of wax and unwax floss in removing plaque. But I will say this, if you have tight contacts, I prefer wax because I have tight contacts and the on wax, when I try to put it, uh, use it, it basically breaks. Um, so I really like the wax and I like the mint. So that way I always have a fresh mouth. Dental floss should be used before toothbrushing for the following reasons. So a lot of people actually floss after, but this is the reason why they should floss before. So when plaque has been removed from proximal surface, the fluoride in the dentifice, which by the way, that's toothpaste, okay? So if you hear the word, uh, did you use dentifice today? <laughs> from the professional, that's toothpaste. Uh, we would really not use that word on a patient because they, they wouldn't know. So it's used during brushing. It's available to reach the proximal surfaces pr for prevention of dental caries. Uh, when brushing is done first, the mouth may feel clean. Thus, the patient may see no need to floss or may not want to take the additional time to floss. And that's why it's really important. The goal of brushing and flossing is to disrupt that plaque uh, biofilm that we spoke of the other day, that white, sticky, uh, that, that's on your teeth, at the gum line, in between. Um, so by brushing and flossing, we can remove that. And we also would educate the patient as you see here. Again, hold the mirror uh, and educate them and make sure that they're doing it correctly. Interdental aids and tough brushes, soft nylon filaments form into a narrow cone shape. We have bridge threaders that are used to pass dental floss under the Pontec. Automatic flosses have one use and perio aid, a handle with holes in the end, design a hole or toothpick. So there's different types of interdental, okay? So um, everybody's different. Some people have a really hard time, but they should use something, okay? Um, patients that have arthritis may need interdental aids. Um, children may need it, older patients may need it. Okay, so, you know, this is your job to explain how to use it. Um, bridge threaders, anybody that gets a bridge, okay? When they get a bridge, they, this happens to be a three-unit bridge. So on a three-unit bridge, the molar on the back and the molar in the front are attached to teeth. But this uh, molar in the middle, it is the tooth is missing. So it is called the ponte. So... Patients need to clean this tooth because there's nothing underneath it. So we can get something that uh, looks like almost like a needle, but it's not sharp like one, it, but it's called a bridge threader. So we put the floss through the loop and then we show them how to use the bridge threader under the bridge. If they've never had a bridge before, they're not going to know how to clean under a bridge. And I can tell you right now, uh, many patients who have bridges, 
if they haven't been using a bridge flosser, I can't tell you how much stuff will go, come out from underneath that bridge of how many years they've had that bridge. So it's really important to educate them. Now, here's some more aids, okay? This looks like a toothpick. A lot of people like to use toothpicks, okay? But be careful. I like to use the rubber ones um, that was shown above here, okay? Because these are uh, more rubbery and easier, but it gets the job done. Dentures. Patients who have full or partial dentures will need to use a denture brush to clean all areas of the denture. So that's another thing. If you, you know, a lot of patients, they get fake teeth, they think they don't have to clean them. It's their teeth, they use it to eat, uh, drink, okay? They get dirty too. A non-abrasive cleaner, such as a commercial dental denture cleanser, a mild soap, dishwashing liquid, or even a mild toothpaste should be used on the brush. It is always a good idea to put water or a towel in the sink so that the dentures will not break if they are dropped because what happens is they become slippery when wet, okay? And if it drops in the sink and it's a porcelain sink, it may chip the teeth. So that's something you need to educate the patients. If they don't have a washcloth, I usually tell them to fill up the sink so that way if it falls out of their hand, it plops into the water and it kind of floats, okay? So... This is a denture brush, okay? There's a lot of cleaners out there that they can use and they should brush the teeth. And for them, it should be easier to uh, clean the, the denture. I can tell you right now that many patients don't do it. Again, why were they educated? Not only should they clean the outside, but they should clean the inside too. Toothpaste contains ingredients designed to remove food residue and includes abrasives to remove stains. Highly polished tooth surfaces will stain less readily and remain clean longer. In addition, most brands of toothpaste now contain fluoride and some toothpaste now contain a compound that reduces calculus formation when they are used regularly after dental prophylaxis. And they also sell toothpaste for children. They basically sell toothpaste of all kinds now. Toothpaste with whitening, toothpaste with mouthwash, toothpaste, I mean, gel, toothpaste, you name it, it's out there. Mouth rinses. So many patients feel like the feeling of freshness provided by a mouth rinse. A wide variety of mouth rinses are available today and some contain fluoride. Recovering alcoholics should select a mouth rinse that does not contain alcohol. Rinsing the mouth with water is recommended after meals and snacks when toothbrushing and interdental cleaning are not possible. And this is just some mouth rinses, but there's so many others. And there's some that are alcohol free and some that have alcohol. Um, by the way, biotin is one of the really good ones for anybody that has um Dry mouth, that's something too that you should learn. When you go into the supermarket, you know, kind of go to the dental aisle and look at all the toothbrushes, all the flosses, all the things that they have for uh, you to recommend to a patient. And again, look in your office because there's usually uh, brochures or samples. Oral irrigation devices, oral irrigators develop a pulsating stream of water or chemical agent through a nozzle to the teeth and gingiva. Can be applied at home by the patient or in the dental office. It helps keep levels of subgingival bacteria to a minimum. In selected patients, oral irrigation can be used to supplement other oral hygiene techniques. So here's a dental water jet. It's one of the irrigators. Um, it's from water pick water flosser. I actually have one a lot of times, uh, not this big. I have a smaller one. Um, a lot of times too, is some of them can use mouthwash. So I put mouthwash and I also use, um, water, mouthwash and water. And then I put the tips in between into proximally to shoot out, uh, anything that might be in between my teeth along with the flossing and everything else that, uh, I do. Now, general guidelines for home care products. The ADA Council on Dental Therapeutic conducts an independent review of the scientific evidence of the research claims and evaluation of home care products. When a product meets the appropriate standard, it is given the ADA seal of acceptance. 
The seal acceptance provides a quality assurance guarantee for consumers and professionals. Check the ADA's website, www.ada.org, for current information on toothbrushes, dentrifices, intraproximal aids, products for the prevention of gingivitis and caries. So if you see this seal on it, again, it was uh, accepted by the ADA, okay, American Dental Association. That is their seal. Look on your toothpastes, look on your dental products. When you buy them, you want to see that seal. Any questions that you may have?